welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen, I'm ready to get into the word of the Lord. Are you today? Yeah. All right, let's do this. Why don't we, if you're able to stand, why don't you go ahead and, uh, as we go before the Lord in prayer, uh, why don't you go ahead and stand in honor and reverence if you can. I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to pray. Father God, we come before you in this place, and Lord, we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to come to the house of the Lord. God, your word says, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Why, God? Because that's where your presence is, where, the, where, where one or two or more are gathered together in your name, Father, you are there in the midst of them. And Father, we thank you that you are here in this place today through your Holy Spirit. God, we don't come into the church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. God, we don't come into the church to be entertained, but Lord, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And so, Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to us. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would use me tonight to deliver the word that you've given to me, Father, through the word of God, and that it would be a seed planted into good ground in our lives and in our hearts. God, that we would walk out of this place and bear much fruit in our lives. God, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, your church, and Lord, the blessings that you've given to us, and that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we don't ask solely on ourselves, but Lord, on all the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that we are not, uh, uh, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but Lord, as co-laborers, so Lord, we ask that you set your hand upon our Catholic brothers and sisters and our Methodist brothers and sisters and our Baptist brothers and sisters, Episcopalian, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Charismatic brothers and sisters. Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon Harvest Christian Fellowship, Father, on the Grove, on Sandals, on the Way World Outreach, on Ecclesia Christian. Father, I thank you that you set your hand upon Emmanuel Baptist, on, on Oak Valley, Abundant Living, on all the churches all across the Inland Empire. Father, more than we can name tonight. But Lord, I thank you that we are all many members of one body, the body of Christ, working together to build the kingdom of God. And we glorify you, Lord. We ask that all the praise, the glory, and the honor go to you in this place tonight. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. Amen. Well, as you're being seated, grab your your word, the sword of the spirit. Hallelujah. Break it open. Let's uh, let's get into it tonight. I'm excited for what God's got in store for us. I'm going to tell you that it's one of those messages for me that... uh, God, sometimes he has a way of of keeping us on the edge of our seats, and today, that was it for me as I sat, read my Bible, and read my Bible this whole weekend saying, where is the message, where is the message, when's it going to come, and about an hour ago it came, hallelujah, I was sweating, whoo, was I sweating, but you know what, God is good, God is faithful, and I know that those are the times when when the Spirit of the Lord has something really he wants to say, and he says, I I don't want you to have too much time to put your emphasis on it, I just want to let let the Holy Spirit do his thing today. And that's what I'm expecting, and that's what I'm confident is going to happen today. So if you've got your word, let's go to the book of John in the fourth chapter. Book of John in the fourth chapter. The title of tonight's message is, There's Something in the Water. They put something in the water. You ever heard that phrase before? Don't drink the water. There's something in the water. Well, today it's a good thing in the water. We're, we're going to talk about drinking the water. That's why I, I told Elijah to stop stealing my messages, because that last song... Stole my message, man. <laughs> Anyways. No, no, I love, I love Elijah. I love our praise and worship team. Here we find ourselves in John, the fourth chapter, and Jesus is, is ministering. Jesus is, is traveling, and here he finds himself coming up to a well. A well is where they get water. You know, you and I, we have the convenience in our day and age of turning on the faucet. And water comes out, and generally speaking, it's been treated of some, some kind or some form or fashion. Uh, But in in, in this day and age, where Jesus was, they had a communal well somewhere where they dug a deep hole, lined it with mud or clay so that it wouldn't collapse on itself, and then they lowered uh, a bucket or some type of of pail into the water, and, and they would retrieve the water that they would use for the day. And so here Jesus finds himself at a well, and he's ministering, and he's speaking, and he says an interesting thing. We're going to read in John the fourth chapter. John the fourth chapter, and let's start in verse number seven. A woman woman of Samaria, John the fourth chapter, verse number seven, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. All right, so right off the bat, we're talking about something in the water. Jesus is here at a a well, and a woman of Samaria, Samaria, a Samaritan woman. Now, you've heard that term before. You may not, that may not mean anything to you, that you may not quite 
understand the significance of this, but let me just give you a little bit of background here. A woman of Samaria or, or a Samaritan, and for example, the, the parable of the good Samaritan. Samaritans were, were separatists to the Jews. They weren't Jews. They weren't Gentiles. They were middle ground. They were like mutts, I guess you could say, as far as in the, in the eyes of the Jews. They weren't they weren't pure Jewish. They, they had been intermingled when the kings of Assyria and, and, and during the captivity. And so they kind of, they were on the outcast. They were on the outskirts of, of Jewish, the Jewish civilization in Samaria. And, and so the Jews, just, they just didn't think very highly of Samaritans. That was the irony in the parable Jesus gave us of the good Samaritan is that he, he talked about Levites and he talked about priests. And then all of a sudden a Samaritan, this, this kind of social reject, was the one that actually gave the service to the man that was in need on the road, if you recall the parable. So here Jesus is at a well, and a woman of Samaria comes to the well, and Jesus speaks to her, give me a drink. Okay, let me just back up a little bit, give you a little bit of social uh, background here. See, you and I live in today's day and age, and I think that this is amazing. I think that we, I don't think the church really has a concept of this. Praise God we've come to where we are at today. I, I don't want to go back. I don't think we should ever go back. But in the social culture of Jesus' day and age, there were a couple things that uh, that especially people uh, of, of stature would do. First of all, women were not uh, considered equals as, as, as men were in, in the first century back in the day. They were not on the same playing field as a man. Man. Uh, you see this in cultures around the world. As a matter, a matter of fact, there are there are certain religions and there are certain beliefs where women, you know, they can't hold jobs or they can't go out without having their heads covered or or even having their entire bodies covered. And a lot of this was the tradition of the day. Uh, that was just the custom. Even in the Roman cultures, as, as they were educated and as they were uh, open-minded, I guess you could say, in their day and age, even in their day and age, women were not held to the same statutes as men were. So, generally speaking, men in public, men out in the open in Jesus' times wouldn't really address women. Men addressed men. That's why as you read the Bible, you talk about, you know, you remember the story of uh, Jesus feeding the multitudes? It, it, it gives us the count of men. You ever notice that? It's about, about 5,000, about 4,000 men, not including women and children, you see, because men were the representation. That was, that was where they stood. And so here Jesus is at a well, and a woman comes to Jesus, and he speaks to her. Let alone not just a woman, but a woman of Samaria. So that's kind of like a double whammy. Because not only is it a woman, and socially at the time of Jesus, you didn't really do that. You didn't really speak to her. You didn't really talk in public. But also, Jews didn't really like to converse or associate with Samaritans. So she comes to the well, and Jesus, just imagine, I guess, if you can get the visual illustration. Here's Jesus, maybe leaning against the well, or just kind of hanging out, sitting there, waiting for it. He's setting it up. He knows what's about to happen. And so here is Jesus. He's kind of setting it up. The woman comes, and Jesus says, hey, give me a drink. Okay, that, that's not a big deal. You're like, Pastor Luke, you did a lot of background explanation for Jesus just asking for a, jink, a drink. Well, there's more to it than that. And so Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink. Verse number eight, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. You see, they had been traveling. Now it was time to rest, time to recuperate. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, being a Samaritan woman? So she was surprised. She was taken aback. She's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This guy is clearly a Jew, and he's asking me for a drink. And she's like, I don't get this. What's going on? Jesus says to her in verse number 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So Jesus says, she says, the, the Samaritan woman, as, we, as you kind of lay this out, she says, listen, I don't, I don't understand. How is it that you would do ask me for a drink? It's just, this isn't right. And Jesus says, if you would know, if you would have known what was about to come your way or the gift that was about to be given to you, and the person who was addressing, see, Jesus knows right off the bat, well, I, I, I may be of Jewish blood, from my birth mother, but I, I, I go far beyond Judaism. I go far beyond the heritage of the culture of my people. You see, Jesus was, was far beyond that. And he says, just be, above being a Jew, above being a religious leader or, or a spiritual leader, there's something more that's about to come. And he says, if you would know who I am or if you actually knew who I was, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be me asking you for a drink, but rather you would be asking me for a drink and you wouldn't be asking me for water out of a well you would be asking me for living water. And so I, I, I can imagine at, at this point, 
Jesus had a, had a tendency to do this. He kind of would take what you would know and he would, he would kind of stump you. You know, if you ever read the Bible, if you ever read the Pharisees when they try to question him, Jesus was, was so tactful and, and so skilled in the way of, of debating or of presenting something that he would kind of bring something. It, it, he would almost stump you to the point where now all of a sudden your defenses or your walls that you might have had up are gone because you, you really don't even know how to respond. You know, could you imagine going up to a well or going, let's say, at, at work, okay? You're at work and you go to the water cooler. That's the 21st century well of our day, okay? You go to the water cooler or maybe you don't even drink water anymore, so you go to the coffee pot, okay? And there is somebody else standing and that person, as you approach them, uh, they say to you, hey, give me, give me some. Give me, pour me a cup of water. Pour, pour, me, pour, pour me coffee. And you're like, hey, why are you asking me to pour you? You get it. And they responded, well, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. You'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we talking about coffee? Are we talking about water? So she's a little bit stumped here. So Jesus goes on, and the woman goes on to, sir, goes on to say to him, verse number 11, the woman says to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. What then, where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank? From it himself as a well, his as as a well as his sons and his livestock. So you can see clearly she stumped. She is on the, Jesus. I love this. You see, Jesus, she's talking about water. Jesus talks about living water, which, listen, before we go any further talking about something in the water, we're gonna be talking about the living water, you know, the, the fountains and all that stuff. We're not talking about water. Okay, he's using this as an analogy. He's using this as a title. He's using it as an illustration. So Jesus says, I got living water. And she's kind of like scratching her head. And she's like, even if I was to ask you for a drink, you don't even have a bucket. So I, I, how are you going to get this living water out of this well that Jacob and his sons and his livestock drank from? And she's like, Totally on some other page. And you can just tell Jesus is laughing on the inside like, I got her. I got her right where I want her. She has no clue what's about to hit her. And, and that's, that's a good place to be. I mean, oftentimes you and I come to church and we think, all right, I got it. I hear the word. I hear the word. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit hits us and he's like, I got you right where I want you. And so she thinks she's got it. She thinks I'm having an intellectual conversation with this guy. I'm trying to, this guy is, he's, he's somewhere else. So then Jesus comes and says, verse number 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse number 15, the woman says to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw, see, she, this lady, uh, you're going to love the Samaritan woman. She is still on the same page. Jesus says, listen, if you drink out of this well. If I was to drop a bucket and give you water out of this well, you're going to come back. You're going to be thirsty again. That's the natural process. But he says, if you take the water that I give you and you drink of it, you're never going to thirst again. You're going to have a well or fountain of everlasting life. And this lady is thinking still water. And she's like, Give me this water. I am so tired of going back and forth and back and forth to the well to get water. So she says, Jesus, please give me water so that I don't have to return to the well anymore. She's still on the same page. So Jesus, you can just tell. Okay, I need to reveal a little bit more about myself to this lady. So verse number 16, Jesus says to her, okay, go call your husband and come here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. She knows. Well, well, the lady says verse number 17. The woman, if you've ever, before I go any further, before I go any further, in, in Christendom or in Christianity in today's day, there's a subject that we use. I guess you could call it Christianese or whatever, but uh, it, it's called reading the mail, okay? If you ever want to know, if you ever heard a pastor or somebody talk about, man, that dude read my mail, or, it doesn't mean that they went to your mailbox and read your mail, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a statement of phrase. And let me show you what reading your mail looks like, okay? Because Jesus is about to read the Samaritan woman's mail. All right, here we go. Jesus says, go call your husband and come from here. The woman answers and says, I have no husband. And Jesus says to her, you have well said. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one who you now have is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. He says, listen, lady, you didn't, you didn't lie. 
you've actually been married five times, and now you're with another dude, not even your husband. And he's like, so technically speaking, yes, you, you, you didn't lie, but there's, there's some history here behind it. And she all of a sudden says, the woman says to him, sir, I notice that she, she kind of perked up a little bit. I love that. She, she kind of just stepped back, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Duh. You just got your mail read. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and, and you, the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus goes on to tell her that, believe me, the hour is coming that you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. We know that, verse number 22, I don't think I have this on the overdrive. I'm just going to read it real quick because this is beyond what we're going to talk about tonight. But he tells her, you worship what you don't know. We know that we worship for the salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now and is now the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And for the God, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse number 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. She goes on to say, I know that someday there's a Messiah coming. I know that. I've heard that through the grapevine that the Jews believe someday that, and he goes, you know, as Jesus is revealing himself to her, and Jesus goes on to say, I am that person which you're talking about. Hello, here it is. Jesus says, you get it now? I think you understand that the water I was talking about, lady, was not really water. And she, she goes and gathers everybody in town, all the men in town, probably all six men that she knows in the little township. Do the math. Gathers all the men, brings them back to Jesus, and Jesus begins to teach to them. So all of a sudden, the word of God is spread through this, and Jesus is having this interesting conversation. But I love the statements that Jesus talks about when he's talking about water. So let's go back to, to the earlier verses that we were just at. Starting in verse number 13, Jesus says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain spring of water, spring, springing up into everlasting life. Earlier he talked about the subject or the statement he used of living water. So today I want to talk a little bit about this subject. Jesus refers to this in another section of John, which we'll go to, we'll kind of look at today. But I want to talk a little bit, just quickly, really simple, so easy today. The message tonight I know is so easy. If you can just grab a hold of it, I think it's one of those ones that as, uh, as it goes further into it, it just gets better and better. You know what I mean? We start off and it's kind of like a, a, a duh statement, not very deep, not very, you know, there's not a lot of revelation. But I think at the end you'll see the impact of Jesus' statements. And that's what I'm excited about. But looking at the subject of living waters, there's some things that I wanted to point out that Jesus was kind of mentioning in the background here out of these statements. So we're looking at living waters. If you're taking notes, I guess you could just write living waters with a, with a colon or something of that nature. Living waters in the dash. Number one tonight, the three simple things is living waters. Looking at some of the ideas here. Living waters. Not not uh, not. Bottled waters, not water cooler waters, not faucet waters, not well waters, living waters. Okay, there's only, li the only living water it, we're going to see in just a moment. Living waters, number one, Jesus is the only supplier. Okay, get this. Jesus is the only supplier. You can't buy the water. You can't search in the world for a secret fountain located somewhere in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. There's no one else in, this, in the world that holds this secret water. Hey, listen, that for a suggested donation, you can send in and get a bottle of this special elixir, here, miracle uh, fountain water, and, and, and be healed by drinking. I'm not going to get on my soapbox about what I saw a couple weeks ago, flipping through the TV on a late night hour. Wait a minute, that sounds bad. It was about, it was, it was a Christian thing, okay? It was, it was, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Talking about waters. There was somebody selling miracle healing. I'm not going to get on that, okay? The truth is, is that Jesus is the only supplier of living waters. You can't buy it, can't fabricate it. You may have a well on your property. You may have a zero water filter or a Brita water filter, but it doesn't matter how much you filter it. It doesn't matter how many microns are in it or not in it. It doesn't matter how much fluoride is in your water or not in your water. No matter what you do, you cannot supply living water because the living waters are only supplied by Jesus. Jesus is the worldwide distribution leader and, and the, the, the monopoly holder, if you can think of it like that, of living waters. You can only get it from Jesus. And here he tells the woman at the well, he says to her, verse number 14, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, talking about the well. You can imagine him pointing to the well or looking down at the bucket that maybe she was holding. 
But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. You see, Jesus didn't say, listen, this is a magical fountain. I laid my hands on it. Now, you, if you drink out of this fountain because I prayed over it, because I sanctified it, now this fountain has living waters. No, he says, I have got to give you the waters of life, the living waters. It is a gift from me. See, now that, that makes sense. Now, if you think about it, when you're talking about Jesus being the sole distributor or the only supplier of living waters, when Jesus said, if you knew who was asking you for a drink, you would say, Listen, I recognize you. I re you. You don't have an Aquafina jacket on. You got living waters on the back of your shirt and in the distributor's name on the front of your shirt. And I know that you are the sole distributor of the one kind of water that I want, the living water. And he says, if you knew that, you would be asking me for a drink. Amen. Guess what, church? You and I know who is the sole distributor of living waters. We know him. We know who he is. Not only do we, know, do we know who he is, but you and I have the honor. We have the privilege. We have the, uh, the, the heritage in our, in our, in, in, because of the price and the sacrifice that he paid for us to not only know who he is, but to know him personally. We have, you know, it's like when you ever, whenever you try to go out and you buy something, isn't it always awesome when you know somebody? When, you, when you're trying to get something done or some work done at your house and you got a contractor friend and you get the family discount or, or when you, you know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? You, you, you're in with somebody. You think, I got connections. Guess what? You got connections when it comes to living water. You know the distributor. And Jesus is the only source. So keep, your, keep your Bible or keep your thumb in John, uh, the fourth chapter. I put a ribbon there. I've got a ribbon in my Bible. Let's go to John a couple chapters forward. John, the seventh chapter. John, the seventh chapter. Jesus uses this term again. John, the seventh chapter. Verse number 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Okay, I love this. See, this is a great example because here's his last day. Here's this great feast. People have gathered together. And here's this illustration. Imagine this. Jesus stands up and he cries out. All right, so this isn't Jesus just kind of standing on a street corner whispering it to Peter or, or, or kind of just letting his disciples know, hey, guys, I'm the living water. I'm, I'm the, I'm, uh, you come to me if you're thirsty, and I will give you drink, and you'll never thirst. He's not saying this quietly. See, Jesus, the example is, is that Jesus stood up. He got up on the curb. He got up on the ledge. He stood up on the edge of the fountain, and he cried out, grabbed the bullhorn of his day, two hands, put them together, and said, hey. Look what Jesus says. He says, hey, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me. As scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus gets up and shouts and says, you can come to me and drink. You see, we're not talking about water because you can't come to Jesus and ask Jesus. I, listen, I'm sure as a pastor, there's so many times we talk about, I remember one time I preached a message about fear, a fear of the Lord. And a couple people came after the door and shook my hand and as they were shaking my hand, they took the message and, and they applied it to what they're afraid of. I remember one time I preached a message about living life for today, and I remember one of my family members was like, man, you know, talking about living your life for today for the Word of God. And one of my family members was like, your message really inspired me. I'm going to learn the guitar. I'm like, so you know that Jesus stood up on the, on the curb and was like, come to me, you who are thirsty, and you'll never thirst again. And people probably really liked the woman the Samaritan well came up and said, Jesus, you got water? I'm pretty thirsty, actually. I'm pretty parched. The wind's been blowing. I'm thirsty. No, I'm not talking about real water. I don't, it's not about water. I've got spiritual water. I've got living water. I've got water that will, will do more than just what water will do for your... You see, we've got to shed ourselves or shed our understandings of natural occurrences and trust that Jesus is the distributor of spiritual living water. And there are some things that come from that living water, and that's what I'm excited about. Jesus wasn't like the water boy. Obsessed with H2O. we got to understand that when we talk about Jesus being the distributor of living waters, please, church, don't think that Pastor Luke tonight is talking about water. All right, we're talking about spiritual water. We're talking about the power of God. We're talking about the power of God inside of you. Jesus is just using water as an example. But he wasn't the water boy. 
Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life in John the 14th chapter. No one comes to the Father except through me. You hear this every time we talk in our, in, our, in our altar calls. And see, Jesus is the only distributor. You can't get living water from a TV ad. You can't get living water from somebody that says that they've got this new elixir or that, that they found this secret well or this came out of, uh, out of the church where you would dip your finger in. And, and, and listen, I'm not knocking what other beliefs or other, uh, other religions believe or do. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that water is water, but Jesus Christ is the only distributor of living water. And you can't find it anywhere else. Don't go looking for it anywhere else. Are you with me today? So we're talking about living waters in, in, in John the 14th chapter. If you got your ribbons, let's go back to look what Jesus was talking about again. In John the 14th chapter, just a few pages back. Number two for tonight, living waters. Jesus is the only satisfier. So Jesus, number one, was the only supplier. Secondly, Jesus is the only satisfier. You see, you and I could work till we're blue in the face. We can live our life to the utmost, to the fullest. We can have and we can lose and we can have again. You can gain possessions, wealth, status, whatever have you. But nothing fully satisfies the soul like Jesus. As a matter of fact, as we read when Jesus read the Samaritan's woman's mail, you see that he was exactly making that point. She had a longing inside of her to be loved or to love a man. Just so happens that she fed that or, or she quenched that thirst inside of her by finding or falling into the arms of five men, six men total. And you see, Jesus says, that you thirst when you drink water, but when you drink the water that Jesus supplies, the living water, that he is the one and the only one that satisfies. Yeah. Verse number 14, whoever drinks the water I shall give him will never thirst. You see, the woman at the time thought he was talking about physical water. And she says, great, this is what I want to do. I don't ever want to have to drink water. Again. Listen. You know, the doctors, they tell you you got to drink eight cups of water a day or eight glasses of water a day. That's tough. I know some of you are organic people and some of you healthy living style. You're like, no, man, I know our technical director, John, carries this gallon jug of water a day. But, man, when I put a glass of water and I drink it, I'm like, seven more? Man, that's tough. So the woman says, I don't want to have to drink eight more glasses a day. One would be great, and that's it. But Jesus says, listen, that's not it. That's not going to fulfill. Water will never fulfill your bodily or, or, or living waters, uh, water will never fulfill your bodily thirst. It'll always come, it'll always come. But Jesus' living water will fulfill the thirst of your soul. You'll never thirst again. You know, in Psalms, the 63rd chapter, I'm not going to put it up there, but in Psalms, the 63rd chapter, the psalmist, in, in, in actually, actually in numerous occasions, talks about this. David, or, or the psalmist, whoever was writing at the time, says, my soul thirsts for you, in Psalms, the 63rd chapter, first verse, as, a dry in, as in a dry and weary land. In Psalms, the 42nd chapter, the psalmist says, my soul thirsts for God. You see, you and I have been, inside of us has been placed a longing to fill holes. You and I know this. We do this. Listen, you and I have done this before. You filled your holes. You filled the longing or the desires in your life with hobbies, with, with status, with symbols, with clothes, women with men, men with women. You fill the holes with, with, uh, uh, with junk or rubbish. I mean, we do this. This is the natural tendency of, of mankind is that we were born. There was something inside of us from the creation of man. When God said, let us create a, a man in our image, and he made Adam and he made Eve, and Adam and Eve were connected with God in the garden. You see, their soul didn't thirst. They, they were connected. They were united with God. But when the man, when man fell, when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the, knowledge of, the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all of a sudden something separated from them. The devil, like he said, their eyes were open and they were now conscious of sin. And now because of their sin nature, because of their consciousness, there was a chasm or a gap left inside of them that, that was once connected with God. You see, they had it. You get this? You, you see what I'm saying? Is Adam and Eve, mankind, once had a, un a connection with God, a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship where God spoke with Adam and Adam walked with God. But then all of a sudden, because of their sin nature, because of their consciousness of sin, they lost it. You've ever heard that term, it's better to have love and lost than to have never loved at all? It's stinking tough to have love and lost. 
Sometimes I think ignorance is a little bit more blissful. And here you think about it. Adam, mankind, has had and has lost. And now there's a hole inside of us that we fill with the things of this world. We fill with the waters from the natural wells. We fill with hobbies, or we fill with careers, or we fill with kids, or we fill with family, or we fill with TV, or we fill with entertainment. We fill with news or information. Because there's a longing gap inside of us. God created us that way. Because there's a soul, there's a, a thirst for you and I, and that thirst comes from our soul, from our innermost being. And because we thirst, when we realize that we are thirsting, and everything that we pour in to our lives does not quench the thirst, then we start to realize that there has got to be something more to this life. Like we talked about today, a plan that God has for us in mature thinking. There's got to be something more to this life than just existing because there's a burning or there's a yearning inside of us that we have got to quench. And God designed that quench to be, that, that burning to be, to be satisfied, to be filled with the living waters of Jesus Christ. So that we would once again have what we once as mankind had, a united connection or a relationship with God Almighty. And that's why Jesus says, when you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. Why? Because it doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you don't have. It doesn't matter what your status is or your bank account says. It doesn't matter what the clothes you have or whatever else it might be that you want to fill with your life. It doesn't matter because now all of a sudden you have been quenched. That burning desire has been quenched. You know, it's not on the overhead, but if you got your Bibles, it was a last minute thing as I was walking out. The Lord gave it to me. Philippians in the fourth chapter. Philippians in the fourth chapter, Paul the Apostle says. Philippians in the fourth chapter, verse number 11. Paul says, not that I speak in regard to need, Philippians 4.11. For I have learned whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be both full and hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know this verse for Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, Paul the Apostle says, listen, my soul, my thirst has been satisfied. So you know what? I can go and do the things that I like to do. I can have my hobbies. I can have my career. I can have my friends. I can have the things that I like to do that I feel that, that are, are beneficial to me. But the, 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 the reality of life is, is that if those things cease to exist, if I have a lot or if I have a little or if I have had a lot and I have lost it all, it doesn't matter because my soul, ultimately, my thirst has been quenched and I have the fountains of living waters on the inside of me and the burning desire to fill that gap has been filled by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and everything else to me is just excess and is just for, for, for whatever sake while we're here on this planet. But the truth is, is that we have long awaited this burning desire in our lives and guess what? There is more to come in our relationship with God. Then, then our time, our short time here, I truly believe that you and I will have eternity with Jesus in heaven. And we will understand what it is really like to not have any lack or need. But for now, we get to learn what it's like to be abound or to, to be abased and to abound, to have much or to have little because we are content in our lives. Are you with me today? Last one for this, this evening. Last one. I told you it was short. I told you it was easy. I told you it was simple. But I think this is the cool one. I, this, this is my favorite one. Number three for today. Jesus is the only source. So we talked about Jesus is the only supplier. He's the only satisfier. And he's the only source. You see, supplier and a source are two different things. If you've ever grabbed a bottle of a, a water bottle or a bottle, bottled water, I should say it's a better way to say it, you, you just use usually a slogan somewhere, bottled at the source. As, you know, it kind of gives you the idea of some guy working for, I don't know, Arrowhead or, or, or one of those bottled water companies like with a plastic bottle kind of just sticking it to the spring. Okay, here's one. Okay, here's two. Here's there's no other source to living water. There's nothing else you and I can ever do to imagine or to, to conjure up the source of living water. You see, living water comes 
from Jesus Christ. He's the distributor, and, and Jesus Christ is the distributor. But let me say this. The Holy Spirit are the wheels in which that distribution gets to you and I. Let's not exclude the wonderful power of the Holy Spirit because they work in tandem and in unison together. And so as the Holy Spirit is the one that, that uses the wheels or is the vessel that gets the living water to us, Jesus Christ is the only source of that water. That it doesn't come out of some bubbling brook or some mountain anywhere else, but it is only solely from Jesus Christ. It is bottled truly at the source. You and I being the bottle, Jesus Christ being the source. Are you with me today? Verse number 14, Jesus says as he's talking to the Samaritan woman, he says, but the water that I, or, but whoever drinks of this water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now listen, I love this. I love this. I love this. Jesus says some huge words that, that literally can blow the roof off your expectations and my expectations. I don't think you realize that. Oftentimes we read the Bible, I don't even realize. This is just me reading it right now. It's like, like the Word of God just slaps me in the face sometimes. And here Jesus says, listen, he says, will become. It's a process. It will become in him a fountain, a gurgling, a brook, something that comes out of the ground or something that, that springs up from nothing in a dry place. If you've ever seen a, a spring or an oasis out of the desert, the water seeps up out of the ground and it brings life. To that spot. And Jesus says in your life, dry and thirsty, dreary on the inside. Maybe you don't have what you think you have. Or maybe you don't feel how, you, how God says you ought to feel. Or you don't view yourself as how God says you are in his eyes. But he says when you get the source, Jesus Christ, and you bottle it at the source on the inside of you. Inside of you it becomes, it works its way up. It gradually seeps through the cracks and the crevices and it, out of the hard granite uh, foundations on the inside of you. The hard spots of your heart that you never thought would ever get anything through. Now all of a sudden the waters of living, of life start to seep through. And don't you know that water has a great and a tremendous power. Don't you know that water has a power to level things? Don't you know that water has a power to move mountains, to erode into valleys? The Grand Canyon. I remember just this last summer, the rainstorms that we had in the summer. I don't know if you guys recall. It's so long ago, six months ago. But we had those tremendous rainstorms. In California, and, you know, I, we, we forget that we even have rain. But I remember I live right next. I live in the wash basin of the Santa Ana River Basin. And I remember as I was driving up to look at that and how the river had changed, I had this little fishing hole that I would always go to. It was like my sweet spot. I will never tell you where it's at. Don't ask me. I ain't sharing. But it was like my little honey hole. And the water came. And the water changed that river. And let me tell you something. The river sits in a whole different path than it did right after that storm. But I love how Jesus says it will become in you a fountain, a living water. John uh, or Monica, do you guys have that picture? Can, I, can you put that up if you have it? Did you get the email? Awesome, you did. You guys are awesome. It's hard to tell what this is. That's a rock with water coming out of it. Can you, can you, can you see that with a little cross, a marker? There's a plaque. There's nothing special about that. Would anybody say that there's anything special about water coming out of a rock? Pretty cool. Interesting. It'd be cool to see. You know what that is? Does anybody recognize what this is? Anybody? I hoped not. I hoped not because I thought that that would really get my point across if you didn't know what it was. You want to know what that is? That is called Nevado Mismi. And is in the Peruvian Andes. It is located at 18,363 feet. Let me read an excerpt to you out of National Geographic, okay? Long a subject of argument and speculation, the source of the Amazon River has now been pinpointed by a five-nation National Geographic expedition using state-of-the-art global positioning system, GPS, navigational gear. The point of origin is a trickle of water coming off of a high cliff in the Peruvian Andes. It begins high in the Peruvian Andes on a thin sheet of crystal water flowing down the side of a rock wall. By the time its journey ends in the Atlantic Ocean, some 3,900 miles away, it has become the world's largest river by volume and possibly the longest. It is the mighty Amazon River. Wow. That little trickle 
in that rock at 18,000 feet is the Amazon River. That's what I wanted. I want to just let it sink in. Let it sink in when I said Jesus says, there will become a fountain of living water in you. It'll start as a trickle. It'll start as a trickle. But the more you get it, the more you see it, the more you seek after it, the more it's like a rainstorm. It's like a, a small little stream like that. One drop turns into two drops, turns into three drops, turns into a trickle, hits another tributary, and hits another tributary. And then finally you, you have a river or a stream. And in that stream, that stream runs into another stream. And that stream runs into another stream. And then all of a sudden it all becomes a mighty, raging, rushing river. The power to move mountains. Like the mighty Colorado River, the power to erode the hardest surfaces. You may think it doesn't matter where you're at, whether you're young or old, you may think there are some surfaces in my life that are pretty rock hard from the experiences that I've been in. But don't you know that the water has the power to move rocks? Don't you know that the power of the water, of the, 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 the water of living, the living waters of Jesus Christ have power to erode away the rough and tough spaces on the inside of you? to bring a fountain of living water, a fountain of everlasting life through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have a rushing Amazon River on the inside of you. And Jesus Christ is at the source. But here's the, here's the cool part. Here's the mind-blowing part about a river. The river of life, the river of Jesus, the river of living waters is unlike any other river. Usually a river, actually not usually, in every circumstance, a river flows one direction. It goes from up to down. That's the nature of water, right? But here the river of living waters brings you to the source. The more you explore the river inside of you, the more you explore the fountain on the inside of you, the closer you get to the source. So it's, you're traveling upstream, but then at the same time, as you get closer to the source, the further downstream you travel towards the destination. Jesus says, everlasting life. So see, you're going upstream while going, it's a river, it's like a loop, it's like a never ending, it's one of those lazy pools at the, at the water park. So you just go around and around. The closer you get to the source, the closer you get to the destination. No other river is like that but the river of living waters. From Jesus Christ. So today we can know that Jesus is the only supplier. Don't look anywhere else. Listen, guys, don't go buy the magical miracle healing water or give your suggested. Don't, don't buy into that. I'm not trying to speak against anything of that, but let me tell you something. If you want to buy water, pick your own brand and drink it because it's going to make you thirsty. But when you want to get into the rivers of living water, know that Jesus is the only place you can get it and the Holy Spirit is the only way you and I can get it. Don't look for things in life to satisfy you. Like water, you'll stay thirsty. Look at, we see the Hollywood actors. I think tonight is the night of the Academy Awards, right? So we see an industry that celebrates itself, an industry that celebrates possessions and wealth and status. But how many actors have died of drug overdoses, have taken their lives, have jumped off of bridges? Because that stuff doesn't get you anywhere. Jesus Christ is the only one that satisfies the thirst that has been born inside of you since you were, since you were a, a, a sparkle in God's eye. He is the only one that can satisfy through the Holy Spirit. And finally, Jesus is the only source. A trickle in your heart will someday become a raging river that will move the mountains and the rough edges of your life and make you to be who God has called you to be. Amen? Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord today? <laughs> Praise God. God is good. Amen? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm excited. Jesus, let me just leave this. I had the statement. I just thought I should read it. Jesus left, as Jesus left his disciples, he told them in the upper room, you wait here. Wait here. And they waited. And they waited. And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit, you know this in Acts, the first chapter, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And all of a sudden, for the first time in their lives, the disciples experienced what Jesus was talking about. The Holy Spirit, the living waters inside of them. And they were never the same again. They were never the same again. When you get the power of the holy, or the power of the living waters from Jesus Christ, when you get the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you, let me tell you something: you will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. 
want to ask you, please give me a moment more of your time. I want to just have, I want to ask you a question. So please don't get up, don't walk around. And it's not because I need your, you know, I need you to stare at me or anything like that. It's because the Holy Spirit's going to minister to the people in the place tonight. And you never know if the person next to you, the person that is looking at you as you're walking out, is the one that the Holy Spirit is ministering to. So just give us a moment more of your attention. Give us a moment more of your time. Let me ask you this question. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but why don't we go over some of those answers? You know, you might have said, well, I, I think I'm going to get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible will you find that you can think your way into heaven? Or nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can hope your way into heaven or you can desire your way into heaven? That nowhere will you find that you, because you think you can, you think you can, you think you can, that you're going to get to heaven. You can't get to heaven that way. You know, you might have said, well, you know, Pastor Luke, I, I think that I'm going to get to heaven or I'm, I'm going to go to heaven because I wasn't raised as a Buddhist or as a Hindu or as a Muslim or anything, any other type of world religion. So I always just thought by default or by classification, that means that I'm going to get to heaven. Hey, did you know nowhere in the word of God can you find that you're not going to, you can get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu or as a Muslim or any other type of world religion? You won't find it there. Why? Because that's not it. There's more to getting into heaven than just a, a, a default or a classification system. There's more to it than that. We'll talk about that in a moment. You know, you might even say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm kind of on the rocks as to where I believe. I don't know that heaven is real or that hell is real. I, I just, I, I, haven't, I haven't quite landed on that yet. You know, I respect your beliefs. Or I respect, listen, let me tell you something. Just because you might say in your head that heaven's not a real place or that heaven's not a real place doesn't mean it's not. As a matter of fact, the heaven is a very real place. Hell is a very real place. The Bible talks about it. Uh, in the Old Testament, Jesus thinks it's important enough to mention it as he's teaching. Therefore, it's important enough for you and I to take it serious and to say, regardless of you, whether we believe it or not, it's real. It's like saying, I don't believe in a semi-truck. Maybe because you never saw one. And yet you go stand on the slow lane of the freeway and you'd meet one face to face just because you believe that heaven or hell doesn't exist. Listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough to tell you the truth. It doesn't matter what you think or what you believe. It's real. And it's time to, start, time to start taking it serious. And I want to love you enough and respect you enough to do so. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I, I, I was going to get to heaven because my, I always thought I was getting to heaven because my parents told me I was going to heaven. Because my parents told me as a child that I was a Christian. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I was baptized. I was christened as a baby. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Here I am today. Uh, doesn't that mean something? Doesn't that account for something? That's how you get to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because your parents told you you were a Christian, because your parents told you you were going to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you were baptized or christened or because you sit in service or because here you are today or you went on Christmas and on Easter means that you're going to get to heaven. Listen, you will not find that in the Word of God. Why? Because you can't get to heaven that way. There's more to it than that. But Pastor Luke, I, I'm a good person. I've never cheated on my taxes. I've never, I've never robbed a 7-Eleven. I give to charitable organizations. I don't drive too fast on the, on the freeway. I, I've lived more good in, in my life than bad. Good people go to heaven. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that good people go to heaven. I don't know where we've come up with that idea. It's a great idea. It's wonderful that we can all think that. But the truth is, is that nowhere in the Word of God will you ever find that you're good enough to get into heaven because you live a good life or because you're a good person. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. There's more to it than that. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can get into God's heaven is God's way. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said this about himself. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, we talked about this today in John the 14th chapter, no one goes to, him, goes to the Father except through him. You see, you can't get to heaven your way, can't get to heaven my way, or some well-meaning author or church committee's way. The only way you and I can ever find ourselves in heaven with God for eternity is God's way, through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was having a discussion with a man by the name of Nicodemus in the book of John in the third chapter. You can read it for yourself. The Bible tells us about Nicodemus that Nicodemus was a Pharisee or of the Pharisees. He was a leader of the Jews. What that means is that Nicodemus in our day and age would be, a, would be a, like a, a Ph.D. in theology. Nicodemus was a religious leader of his day. He taught in the synagogue. He knew the word of God. He studied the word of God. He had memorized more scripture than you and I could have thought imaginable. You know, Nicodemus gave to the poor. He did all the right things. He wore all the right clothes. And you would think that when they start to talk about the subject of eternal life, that Jesus would look to Nicodemus and say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you just keep on going, pat him on the back. Great is your reward in heaven. But Jesus says something interesting to Nicodemus. But before I say what he says, let me tell you why. 
Because oftentimes we think that, oh, because I volunteered in the children's ministry, but I carried the pastor's Bible. Because I, 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 I was a leader or I was a member of a church that I'm going to get into heaven. Well, you would think that if that's the case, that Nicodemus would have been scotch-free on his way into heaven. But Jesus looks to Nicodemus and he says to Nicodemus about heaven, he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. There it is. That's it. You know, Hollywood, popular culture, is, uh, society has made a mockery out of that term. They've really dragged it through the coals. You think of radical, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what Hollywood or popular culture says or, or makes of it. I don't care what they say because they have no concept of God. They have no idea what born again means. The truth is, is that from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the eyes of God. It means this, that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. That's what God's after. Hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Everybody look at me for a moment. God is not after your mental ascent towards him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's not after the fact that you can memorize John 3, 16 or a few other Bible verses. He's not after that. Why? Because the Bible, in hell, uh, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is. They're not going to get there. We know that the devil quotes scriptures. So we know that he's not on his way because he memorizes some scriptures. No, no. There's more to it than that, and that's because God is after all of your heart. God is after all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, and he says to the church, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. If I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow. It's a shocking statement. Jesus says that to, to get your attention. And what he's saying is that if you are living a lukewarm life, you are deceived in thinking you're going to get into heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Lukewarm, if you think about it, it's like a warm soda on a hot day. It just doesn't do the job. Lukewarm in terms of your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with God. It's a little bit in and it's a little bit out of church or in and out of your relationship, a little bit up and a little bit down. You've got your highs and your lows and your ins and your outs. Occasional church attendance, token prayer every once and again. Maybe you got a Jesus tattoo or a crucifix around your neck. You know, you, you, you made a statement, but you're not wholehearted for God. But you're, living, you're not living wholehearted against God. You're kind of right in the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you riding the fence, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. He says that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of heaven. And I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth, to not beat around the bush. I don't want you to live in that category in your life and think that you're going to make it. Somebody's got to love you enough to tell you the truth. You can't make it to heaven doing your own thing. A little bit of God, a little bit of the world, can't do it. It's got to be an all or nothing relationship with God. So then how do we do this? How do we get to heaven? How, if we can't do it our way. We can't do it because our parents told us. How do we do that? We can only do it Jesus Christ's way. And Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. The Bible tells us that we were not saved by works, but by faith through grace. You see, salvation, justification, forgiveness of your sins, forgiveness of what you and I have done, even though we may not realize what we have done or even have been aware of it, we have sin in our lives because we were born into it is a gift of God for, to us by Jesus Christ dying a beaten, bloody mess on the cross. So the only way you and I can get there is God's way. And he gave us everything he could in order to ensure that we got our place in heaven with him, with Jesus Christ, by giving us his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess on a cross, a spectacle for the world to see, so that you and I could now in turn give him all of our heart and give him all of our life. That's what God's after today, is all of your heart, all of your life. And here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I want to give you that opportunity and I'm going to do this in just a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two. And on the count of three, I'm going to go bang. I'm going to smack my hand on my Bible real loud, just like that. And when I smack my hand on the Bible on the count of three, if that's you in this place, if you want to give him all of your heart, you want to give him all of your life in just a moment, I want to give you that opportunity. When I smack my hand on the Bible, I want you to raise your hand. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all of my life. I want to make him the Lord and Savior of my life. I acknowledge that I need to go forward for God, and I want to leave hell behind. I'll see your hand, I'll acknowledge it, I'll count it or put it, and you can put it right back down, and we'll go on from there. So who should get their hand up in just a moment? If you've never given them all your heart, if you've never given them all your life, 
If that's you in just a moment, when I smack my hand on the Bible, if that's you, get your hand up so I can see it. I'll acknowledge it, put it right back down. Who should get their hand up? Hey, hey, maybe you prayed the prayer with Billy Graham or, or a Harvest Crusade, but you never really followed through with it. Maybe you're not sure. Maybe you did it as a kid, but you never made the public profession, or you're not sure if you're saved. Don't leave this place today without going forward in your relationship for God. So you raise your hand, I'll see you, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down if that's you in this place. Finally, who should get their hand up today? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to God, today let's make it the day that you go hot for God and you leave heaven, or you leave hell behind and you go forward in, in your destiny in heaven forever and ever and ever and you go forward in your relationship with God. Don't leave this place today without making sure in your life. That's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. You don't know what tomorrow holds. I'm not trying to scare you into it. I'm not trying to pressure you into it. But you know what? I am trying to tell you the truth. And I love you enough. I respect you enough. I know sometimes people think, Pastor Luke, you're just being really pushy. Well, don't you know that the devil has been pushy against you all your life to keep your hand down, to keep you into the things of the world. And you ought to be appreciative to have somebody who loves you enough, appreciates you enough to push you into doing, to making the best decision that you'll ever make. You say, Pastor Luke, I'm going to be embarrassed if I raise my hand. I can't do it. You know what? You might be embarrassed, but get over it. A moment of embarrassment is so much better than an eternity in hell. If you can't confess God in a warm and welcome, loving place like the church, how do you expect to do it in the world? Start somewhere. Start here today. Get your hand up so I can see it in just a moment, and we'll go forward from there. If that's you in this place, all across this auditorium, if that's you, get ready. If you've never given them all your heart, you've never given them all your life, come on, get ready. If you're not sure, let's make sure right now. Here we go, get ready. If you've been living lukewarm, it's time to stop running from God and start running to God. Let's make sure you get hot in your relationship with God and get forward, move forward in your relationship and get your place into heaven for eternity with God. Here we go. I'm going to count. If that's you, get ready. Hands are getting ready to go up from the family rooms, from the foyer. If you're watching by television, get ready. Get your hand up. An usher will see it. If that's you, get ready. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. One, two, three, four. I see you right there. Five. I see you right there. Six, seven, eight. Eight wise people. Nine. I see you right there. Nine wise people. And they're jumping up. If that's you in this place, you say, man, I wonder if I should. Where are you at? Number, where are you at? Number 10. Come on, where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. If there's nine, don't you know there's ten? Come on. You're thinking, man, I don't know. I'm just not sure. I'm not sure. Listen, let's make sure today. Ten, I see you. Praise God. See that hand back there. Ten wise people. Is there anybody else in the house today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Ten wise people. Anybody else in the place today? Well, praise God for ten wise people. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Amen. Hey, listen, for those of you that raised your hand, hey, listen, some of those of you in this place that didn't raise your hand, maybe you should have raised your hand. It's not too late. I want to do something. Now, you said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. That's what you did by, I want to raise my hand. I'm, I want to give him all my heart. I want to ask you now to be bold. You said you wanted to give him your heart, give him your life. Let us help you. Let us pray with you. Let us, let us get some information into your hands to get strong. So here's what I'm going to do in a moment. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up and we're going to sing a song. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold, grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend, get out of your seat, get out of your chair, get into the aisleways and come meet me here at the altar. Let's change destinies together and move forward in your relationship together. If that's you, let's all stand together. And if that's you, come on, come on down. If that's you, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Please, at this time, nobody leave. If that's you, come on, you come, come on, from the front to the back. If you're in the foyer, in the family rooms, come on. If that's you, you come, you can come, come on, come on. Hey guys, listen, today is a new day. Listen, you ain't going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You're gonna give your heart, you're gonna give your life to Jesus Christ, amen? Listen, I wanna do something. I wanna introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Joel, like Noel, Joel, all right? For a while there, we were calling him Pastor Joel, but I was getting too much, too much uh, flack for that. So it's Pastor Joel, all right? That's how the white guy says it. Pastor Joel is gonna do something. He's gonna take you right over there. I love to tease this guy. 
He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. You said you were going to give him all your heart. You said you were going to give him all your life. He's going to help you do that. It's not some abracadabra magical words. It's some prayer from the heart. He's going to lead you in there. He's going to help you say that. And then he's going to give you some three free things, some literature, free stuff. Hey, we all love free stuff. He's going to give you a book that our senior pastor, Pastor Jim, wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. It's just a little bit of information to help you get strong. So, you know, sometimes you say, I just got saved. What do I do, from, what do, I do now? We want to help you with that. And the last thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. Hey, we give away friends here at the Rock Church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you before a service. You come before a service for five weeks. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for, for 15, 20 minutes, sit you down, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the ways of the Lord. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. They help you get strong to make sure that you're working your muscles the right way so that you don't waste your time. Well, we got spiritual personal trainers, friends, somebody that come alongside of you, make sure that you're getting strong in the ways of God so you don't go back to the life that you came from and you go forward in your relationship with God. So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Joel. Thank you.